This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Pictures from our past often fascinate us. When I moved to Charlotte in 1976, I immediately began wondering where Charlotte's history and how does this city work? Taking just a moment and looking back. It's human nature to want to revisit your past. Might make you appreciate the present a little more. The challenge is to communicate to people in our city how important it is to preserve this history while it still exists. In the next half hour, we will walk Uptown's Tryon Street, exploring what's changed and what's remained the same. There are three old buildings in addition to the Dunhill. Then meet a Charlotte Observer blogger who finds historic gems of the city's past in the paper's vast archives. They say that Charlotte doesn't have that much of a heart, but it does. You just have to dig a little bit to find where it came from. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. And from Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for nearly 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello, I'm Tony Zeiss, president of Central Piedmont Community College. You know, the rich and diverse history of the Charlotte region is just wonderful, and we at the college want to bring it to you and share it. We understand the importance of history. We understand the importance of learning from the past so that we can do better in the future. I want to tell you that you're in for a real treat. The History Department at Central Piedmont Community College has partnered with our television station to bring you this special one-of-a-kind history program. Stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. It's hard to picture, but right here on the streets of modern Charlotte, there was once a revolutionary war battle. Under your feet were working gold mines, and Tryon Street, with its stoplights and no parking zones, was once just a dirt wagon road. Much of that's now forgotten, but there are those who are working to preserve the photographic past of Charlotte's built environment. In a small office, Charlotte attorney and historian David Erdman scans vintage postcards. I got interested in buildings and places and how cities work. I learned that many, many, many of the buildings that represent the history of the city are no longer standing. My process is to scan the fronts of all the pictures scan the backs or label them on my computer so I know years for them. Erdman's passion, save as much of Charlotte's photographic history as possible. In this instance, the, the very nice lady, Miss Irwin, lent me her treasured uh, binder of postcards that she collected. I mean, this one's postmarked, well, I can't tell, but I can tell you that building burned down in 1923. So uh, we know it's before that time. It's a detective game and Erdman wants to know the who, what, when, and where of each of the 5,000 plus images in his collection. With that knowledge, he organizes each image by address. This method allows you to take a stroll down different streets through historic pictures. I meet up with David Erdman at the square in Uptown Charlotte. With his pictures and notes, we head off to explore Tryon Street. Gary, this picture, which is a photograph, is technically a colorized photograph. It was a black and white photograph. Typically, the printers sent them to Germany, and the Germans would fill in whatever color they thought the buildings ought to be. So you see different photographs, different cards with different color buildings. However, this is a great picture of looking right down Tryon Street because you have the old Central Hotel, which was right here on the corner where the 40-story Bank of America building is. You have the Blake's Pharmacy, which was right on the corner here at the square where the park is now. And looking down the street, because it's south on Tryon, of course, none of these buildings, none of them are still standing. And I think what's interesting is you've got the trolley tracks right down the center of the street, and you've also got them coming in across the square. 
So there were lots of little shops that if we were walking by there today, it's one or two buildings to block. In those days, there'd be 10 or more buildings per block because they'd be narrow buildings, like three windows wide, two windows wide, three windows wide, two windows wide, six or eight windows wide, just a bunch of small individual shops. You know, looking at this photograph and looking at what it is today, it's just a stark reminder of how much everything has changed. This is unrecognizable. You wouldn't look at this and say Charlotte. You're right. In fact, in fact, people who have not studied the pictures would not recognize it at all. That is correct, because there's not a single building on either side of the street that's still standing. If the steeple way down at the end is the Catholic Church, and there's no way to tell that, that would be the one standing building in this picture. So now we've crossed the square and we're looking north on Tryon. So tell us a little bit about how this is different from what we have today. Well, this picture is especially interesting because it has a horse and buggy in the picture. But in the 1920s, the horse and buggy was still on the streets along with the cars that you see in this picture. And these are slightly earlier models, so it might be early 1920s. Now the Ivy's building was built shortly after this picture, but it's not in this picture as we look north on Tryon. And the only reason I mention Ivy's is because it's still standing. You know, they have the Ivy's condominiums. The most magnificent building maybe in the city was our City Hall. And City Hall was built in the late 1890s and torn down in the mid-1920s. But it was a magnificent building that reminds me of the City Hall in Philadelphia. So again, you've got narrow stores, many, many of them, because you've got a very compact central city and by 1920, the city of Charlotte was edging up towards 60,000 people, but it was still a very compact and small area. How did the development of North Tryon differ from what was happening on South Tryon? For whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, churches tended to congregate to the north. We can see the steeple of one of the Methodist churches, the steeple of one of, of, the, of the Lutheran church, we can see the steeple of the second Presbyterian church. It's fascinating to see these colorized photographs and what a busy city and what a broad avenue Tryon Street was. I've always felt that the founding leaders of this city envisioned a big city, even though they started with a tiny crossroads. And the way I feel that is a small town lays out narrow streets right. and then comes to regret it. Right. This town laid out a very broad Tryon Street. Thinking for the future. Thinking for the future, I believe. That's such a historic site because, as you know, that's where James B. Duke had his offices next to where the Johnston Building is now. So, David, we've moved about half a block down south on Tryon, and we're at roughly the same perspective as this postcard from the 1920s. Yes. Now, as we've established, the built landscape of modern Charlotte really looks nothing like this. That's but right. Some of these folks in this picture, if they were to look at a postcard, say, from the 1820s, what would their reaction be to uh, the difference in the built environment? Well, you know, in the 1820s, all of our buildings basically were built of wood. And of course, we had a courthouse right in the middle, on this picture, at the middle of Trade and Tryon. They had a courthouse up on tall stilts, which, of course, was involved in the Battle of Charlotte. We're right by the Battle of Charlotte plaque. And clearly important documents were read to the public there. And maybe the most important event in the entire American history that happened there was when General Nathaniel Green took over the Southern Army for the Americans because after that things went very well for the Americans in the South. So the square was a celebrated place in this city. And, and the first courthouse that replaced the wooden courthouse was built around 1810. And frankly, I don't think I know where it was. Then there was another courthouse built in the 1850s or so down West Trade Street. See, Charlotte's had about seven courthouses. It's amazing. And one more piece of history, of course, is that Mecklenburg County was about three times as large in the eight, right. 1700s as it is now. Right. And so this crossroads of trade and crime and the people who lived around it fought to get the county seat put yes. at this crossroads as opposed to somewhere that would now be Cabarrus County. And that kind of got Charlotte a little nucleus of development. 
by the way, the Johnson building has just recently been sold, and the, the new owner has invested a lot of money in it. Right. Gary, we're standing in the 200 block. I, I tend to think of what the numbers are because we're trying to position buildings that don't exist anymore in our minds. We're in the 200 block of South Tryon Street, and across the street from us, because we're on the east side, is what was called in this picture Charlotte's Finest Business Block. Charlotte NC, 1920s. And that's not hyperbole, because this tall building, which we also saw in an earlier picture looking from the opposite direction, was a bank building. Next to it was a bank building. Next to it, I believe, was a bank building. The next building was the home of the Southern Power Company, which was James B. Duke's company that became the Duke Power Company after his death and became what we now know as Duke Energy. And so this was the money magnet for the city. When the James B. Duke building burned down around 1923, they built the Johnston building, which is still standing, on its footprint. And the Johnston building is a great success and a remarkable architectural achievement. It's got, if we could be up at the 14th floor, we could see all the beautiful architectural features, which are almost New York fancy, almost New York style. And yet the building's lines have survived very well because it's not overly ornate. Until about 1982, there was a very historic building standing in this corner called the Wilder Building. David, so far we've basically talked a lot about buildings that are no longer here. But here, further down South Triad, we're in front of the Latta Arcade, which was built in 1914. So a building that has been here a while. What can you tell us about the Latta Arcade? Well, I think it's absolutely wonderful that it is still standing. You commented yourself on how short buildings don't necessarily fit in on Tryon Street. And here's one that's basically two stories, two and a half stories, you might say, that's more than 100 years old. It was a very popular style in America, I guess, before World War I. It had natural lighting with the sunlight coming in, typically two stories, sometimes three stories. David, on the other side of Letta Arcade, currently stands the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce, but as you told me, this used to be the site of the YMCA. You know, the YMCA, of course, none of us remember this because we're not old enough, but the YMCA was a very, very important institution in our city, more than really you could imagine. And in fact, as I think back of buildings, and there was a beautiful building that stood right there where the Charlotte Chamber is, the YMCA building following the city hall uptown that we talked about, the courthouse was right here, I would say the YMCA was the third most important building in the city. Many times when the city pride was being shown, photographs were taken on the steps of the YMCA building. It was architecturally a showpiece, um, and it was uh, just a, a centerpiece of the society. They played a lot of basketball there. They did a lot of swimming there. And of course, they had to have a YWCA for the women down the corner. Okay, so David, here we are further down south on Tryon, almost to the edge of uptown. We're only about a block away from the Beltway. And we're here in, in front of the Be Beckler and the Mint Museum, which has almost become the postcard of modern Charlotte, this art district, if you will. But actually, we're also in front of one of the oldest buildings to still exist on South Tryon, St. Peter's Catholic Church. Yes, I know of no building older than St. Peter's Catholic on South Tryon Street. It's roughly 1893 and the convent's next door to it. So this is a magnificent building and thank goodness it's still preserved. Um, and the church, of course, is an active congregation. You can see the uh, solid buttresses uh, in the design. You see a steeple that is very reminiscent of Georgetown University, which is a Catholic icon itself, uh, and a beautiful slate roof and, the, and the, may even have gold crosses. I'll point out while we're here the Ratcliffe Flowers sign. You see there was a very fine old historic uh, business called Ratcliffe's Flowers. The building is still standing. They put the sign here as a memento for this. It's, it's nice to see little symbols and remembrances of our history.
David, one of the biggest features, literally, of the new Charlotte landscape is part of the skyline, which is made possible by skyscrapers. And we're here in front of the first skyscraper in Charlotte. Yes, about 1972, Wachovia Bank and Winston-Salem decided to build this magnificent tower in Charlotte. And that set off a, a competition because First Union Bank said, well, our building isn't tall enough, so they built a tower behind theirs shortly thereafter. And Bank of America, which then was called NCNB, said, well, our tower isn't tall enough. They built one 40 stories tall. So you went from roughly 28 to roughly 31 to roughly 40 in a short period of time, like three years. All of a sudden, there was a space race, as they used to call it, uh, for building skyscrapers. And Charlotte finally had a real skyline. David, we've said a lot about skyscrapers, the built environment, the development of Charlotte, but as we walk back up Tryon, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say a little bit more about the very important historical development that took place here, that being Cornwallis's march, oh, the Battle yes. of Charlotte. Oh, yes. Well, this area where we're looking at right now, where the Wachovia Bank is, and, oh, excuse me, the former Wachovia building, now labeled Bank of America, is supposed to be, and of course, none of us were witnesses to this, and there are no photographs to prove it, but it's supposed to be where Cornwallis encamped his troops in our city when, let's be frank about it, they invaded our city to fight and chase the patriots, which they encountered further up the street. So this was a battlefield of sorts and very much a, a military encampment right here on South Tryon Street. I'll add, I've always thought that Cornwallis expected a town named after the queen with a street named after the former royal governor to be more friendly yes. than it was. Yes. And you know, he ended up labeling it a hornet's nest of rebellion. Here at 6th and Tryon, North Tryon, is the public library, the main branch of the public library. But as I understand, as you've to told me, this is not the oldest uh, version of the library. Well, it's really kind of amazing. It's been a library site for 100 years. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, the famous steel magnate who supported libraries, um, gave $25,000 to this city to build a magnificent uh, library Li building, a very monumental building with big columns in the early 1900s. And um, that library lasted until about 1955, when the city, for whatever reason, tore it down and built another library, supposedly modern, I guess, to last forever. And then in the 15 years ago, they tore that one down and built this library. This library is very functional. I think it's a nice library. But, but ironically, it's now an empty space in front of the library where the original Andrew Carnegie Library would have been, could have been, but wasn't preserved. Dave, what can you tell us about Spirit Square? Well, Spirit Square was originally a church, which of course is why it looks like a church, particularly indoors. Uh, but about 1972 or so, First Baptist Church, which had had its congregation here since roughly 1908, uh, moved out and set up its new um, campus, really, of buildings over on Davidson Street. And this building was empty for about five years and a woman named Harriet Cuthbertson stepped forward and said, we need to save this building. And people were saying, well, what could we use it for? Answer, an arts center. And so it became what we know as Spirit Square. As recently as the past five years, this building has been talked about by it's being torn down, but our county commission has decided not to tear it down so far, and I hope they never, ever will, because of this entire picture, looking down Tryon Street, this building is the only surviving building from this picture from probably the 1920s when trolley tracks ran right next to us down Tryon Street. There's the Carnegie Library, there's the City Hall, uh, there's the old Independence Building, the Methodist Church that was torn down to build a newer Methodist Church, and the second Presbyterian Church, all gone. So this is a very important bulwark of historic preservation, which I hope will always be here. And it's a very fine building with many beautiful and well-preserved architectural features.
David, earlier when we were on South Tryon, you mentioned St. Peter's Catholic Church being the oldest building on South Tryon, being an acre on South Tryon. Interesting enough, here on North Tryon, we have another St. Peter's. We do, and I believe it's the oldest building on North Tryon Street at this point in history. 1892, a magnificent example of brownstone. And of course, with this very vibrant congregation, this building will probably be here always. It's not endangered like some other buildings, but it's a gorgeous piece of architecture. and 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 it's a little bit resembling the city hall that was further south on North Tryon Street. It had the same, it was built in the same era and it had a lot of the same features. In this tiny room at the Charlotte Observer, Maria David zips through pages and pages of the paper's microfilm archive. She's on a hunt for something unique. The little hen is served on a half pineapple divided lengthwise and the pineapple's top leaves form the tail feathers of the bird of paradise. <laughs> something unique from Charlotte's past. Here's a Charlotte Checkers hockey game. This was in 1961, February. It's Maria's job as the paper's Adam photo archivist to maintain the retro Charlotte blog, oh, yeah. which she finds in here might just end up on here. People love it. Yes, they love it. Maria says she never knows what she might find. The paper's microfilm archive goes all the way back to the late 1800s. You go in there looking for something specific and you're scrolling towards that date on the microfilm. You get stopped by so many fascinating advertisements, stories um, that you may never reach where you're intending to go originally. While the published stories, pictures, and ads are found mostly on microfilm, she also has at her fingertips, contained in a digital archive, the newspaper's unpublished photographs. And when it's time to do a blog, I'll just pop in one of the expansion discs and find a theme that appeals to me that day. Maybe it has to do with a current event, an anniversary. It could just be something intriguing. Uh, recently, I did one on uh, the evolution, the history of Memorial Stadium. I included some photos of rock concerts there, of uh, some work on the expansion, of people lining up to see Shrine Bowl games. Maria publishes the Retro Charlotte blog three times a week. You can find it on the Charlotte Observer's website. The blog is fun because I get a lot of feedback. A lot of comments, a lot of questions, a lot of ideas from readers, you know, can we do this, can we do that? And I'll say, let's do that. Or they'll say, my grandpa had this Flamingo Supper Club, I got that question just recently. Downtown, uptown in the 40s and 50s, do you have any information on that? So I'm like, I'm gonna go look and see if I can find something on that. So uh, it's fascinating and something might just come out of left field and say, boom, that's gonna be the blog today. And like David Erdman, Maria understands the importance of sharing history. It's, it's funny that I guess it's human nature to want to revisit your past. I think it gives you a sense of, of place and continuity in, in your life, uh, some, a sense of stability. Uh, if you look at the newspaper, the Charlotte Observer from the 1930s, they had a weekly section, uh, a weekly feature that said 20 years ago today. So this phenomenon is not new. It's, it's been going on for 100 years where we want to say, oh, I, I remember that 20 years ago, or I was two years old and, uh, um, and my grandmother talks about that day. The Retro Charlotte blog pulls native Charlotteans, maybe they were born at Presbyterian Hospital or the Mercy Hospital, connects them with newcomers. And we have that commonality that we love our city, we love where it's been, we love where it's going. Well, that concludes our look at how the city of Charlotte has changed over the years. We thank you for watching, and be sure to join us next time for a trail of history right here on WTBI PBS Charlotte.
a production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.